As if things weren't bad enough in our roller coaster economy, now this. A new round of budget cut proposals from the Bloomberg administration. Among the more controversial, the closing of 20 fire companies around the city. The only acceptable number for firehouse closings is zero. The city says these cutbacks will not affect the communities they serve. Residents disagree. If Bloomberg were here right now, what would you say to him? This uh, is not going to happen. These closures, <laughs> these firehouse closures are not going to happen. The number of grandparents raising their grandchildren is on the rise. Does that frustrate you? No. No. These kids give me life. How are seniors supposed to handle physical and financial challenges of raising kids? In the South Bronx of all places, we found something of a solution. Safe, affordable housing that is open exclusively to grand families. Do you feel that you're breaking the cycle? I hope so. You know, I'm trying to stop these mothers from abusing their children because there's a lot of it going on. There's something growing in Jersey City. Right in the middle of Greenville is an oasis, a working farm. But the real story here is about the tenders of the crops. The new age farmers are all ex-convicts. So I'm sure a lot of people want to know why you were in prison. Eating and abetting to a homicide. Once hardened men are sowing the seeds of hope, learning a trade, and perhaps better acclimating into society. There's ex-offenders all over. So, you know, what I'm saying? Practically everybody got an ex-offender in their family. I got them in mind, so. I'm Rashida Blair. I'm Melanie Sherry. I'm Kim Burrell. Those stories tonight on a special City University of New York edition of 60 Minutes. As if things weren't bad enough in our roller coaster economy, now this. A new round of budget cut proposals from the Bloomberg administration. Among the more controversial, the closing of 20 fire companies around the city. Hardest hit will be Brooklyn, losing eight in all. The city says these cutbacks will not affect the communities they serve. Residents, and as you might expect, the firefighters union disagree, saying response times and the risk to lives will be increased. What's a borough to do? Well, if you think you can't fight City Hall, come to Brooklyn. The only acceptable number for firehouse closings is zero. No closings, no closings, no closings, no closings. No closings. Actually, demonstrators, lots of them, marched from Brooklyn to City Hall and they all had the same message from Mayor Mike Bloomberg. It's just nuts. He has no priorities that involve people. You know, the citizens of New York, he's entirely out of touch. If I didn't know better, he wants Brooklyn to burn down. I mean, you can't close eight companies uh, in that borough and not understand that you are placing citizens at risk you're placing property at risk, and you're putting the lives of the great firefighters of the FDNY at risk. What's up, New York's business? Make some noise! Make some noise! Make some noise! Make some noise! Until people really get angry uh, and get out in the streets and uh, create a ruckus, uh, the powers that be don't listen to you. Kurt Hill and Daniel Rivera are community activists, part of the People's Firehouse, a nonprofit citizens advocacy group. Why do you think Brooklyn has eight proposed closings? Well, we're a working class area. Uh, we're not an upper middle class and, and billionaire uh, playground area. Uh, we don't have the same uh, upper class population that Manhattan has. And we identify with the people of Brooklyn and we're going to tell the mayor that we're not going to uh, put up with his uh, closings of uh, fire companies. We're just not going to put up with it. There's a line in the sand. Wow. This time around there is a line in the sand. This time around they say they want to avoid what happened to engine company 212. The story of that fire truck began during the budget cuts of the 1970s. When the city came to uh, attempt to take away the engine company, 
Uh, people went around, uh, organized, uh, went in and occupied the firehouse, uh, held the engine hostage. People slept in the firehouse, ate mm -hmm. in the firehouse. Uh, there was a presence 24-7 in the firehouse to make sure that that uh, uh, engine was not removed. After 18 months, uh, the community was victorious. But nearly 30 years later, they lost the fight. Our firehouse was closed in 2003. Right. Finally, the, the mayor got a city. The mayor of the city got his way and mm -hmm. closed the firehouse. Um, and this round, we are certainly showing our solidarity to the other companies by showing up to the protests, mm -hmm. writing letters. Protests and letters aside, the Bloomberg administration says that since the 2003 round of closings, the city has actually seen record lows in fire-related deaths. According to the mayor. Closings are based on financial standings, call frequency, and response times. Alexander Hagen, president of the Uniformed Fire Officers Association, has trouble with this concept. The city was not really forthcoming with their methodology. However, it appears by the uh, literature they've released that they're relying on a statistic known as response time. Uh, response time is a manipulated statistic as many statistics are. Mm -hmm. they, they're in the process of finishing an apartment house across from City Hall, mm -hmm. 70 story apartment house. There is a fire company right across the street, Six Engine. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if there's a call for an alarm in that building, the uh, information will be gathered. We won't be counted anymore. That's the minute they save. The uh, company will be dispatched. Mm -hmm. The doors will go up and they'll say we're here and that will say that their response time is 30 seconds. Yeah. But I ask you if there's a fire on the 70th floor and the elevators are out, which happens very often in fires, mm -hmm. how long will it be before the people get real help? Not and as for the city's plan to save money? Um, well, they, they save money by having to fill less tours, there'll be less overtime for firefighters, there'll be less fuel, Actually, there will be less fuel used. They'll buy less rigs eventually. They'll uh, have to heat fewer buildings. Uh, the, the, let's say this. The savings are illusory. Every fire company saves in real property more than twice their budget. And in some districts, like Bushwick, where homes date back to pre-fire code days, saving property is a matter of time. On Monitor Street, there was a, a row of houses and this was when just after 212 closed. Okay. There were row houses that uh, went up in flames. It must have been like six or seven mm -hmm. uh, houses. And the reason was that, one, is that they were wood frame houses. Mm -hmm. Two, is that they shared an attic, an attic space. And so the fire literally cr crawled from, from one building straight through the attic to the other buildings. Um, and it was learned, it was learned that after that fire that a lot of these row houses, mm -hmm. wooden frame row houses, have roof insulation, uh, attic insulation made out of hay. That's how old the buildings are in, right. the, in, the, in the neighborhood. They were called the Monitor Street, Monitor Street fires. And mm -hmm. it really brought out the fact that the, that the makeup of a neighborhood is, is, should be a criteria for keeping a firehouse open. It's one thing to take away non-essential needs, but you're taking away firehouses that fight fires. People die in fires. So oh, I feel bad because if something happened like fire again, we're going to be more close. There's another one by there in Butchwick. There's another one right here all the way down. So not going to be, with the, the time when they come, we, we already be born already. Would either of you care to comment on this picture? That's the Grim Reaper. I would have not put Mike Bloomberg. I, I probably would have put Mike Doomsburg. If Bloomberg were here right now, what would you say to him? I would say, uh, listen, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, this uh, is not going to happen. These closures, <laughs> these firehouse closures are not going to happen. You know, we're not going to permit it. And people like you are going to begin to pay your fair share of taxes for our city services. That's what I tell him. There's something growing in Jersey City. And for a change, it's not the crime rate, drug infestation, or the levels of poverty. Right in the middle of Greenville, the worst of the worst neighborhoods is an oasis, 
a working farm producing everything from lettuce and tomatoes to onions and fresh corn. But the real story here is about the tenders of the crops. The new age farmers are all ex-convicts, some having served lengthy sentences for serious crimes, including murder. Now, thanks to the program called Friends of the Lifers, once hardened men are sowing the seeds of hope, learning a trade, and perhaps better acclimating into society. There's always to be a person that say that he doesn't deserve a second chance. Mark Graham is a member of Friends of the Lifers. Before joining the group, he served 16 years in prison for weapon charges and another six years for prison violation. So how did you hear about the program? Um, the Green Thumb program was just this program, but um, the Friends of Lifers, I've always been connected with them since like 2008. I bought the shirt. The founder of the Friends of the Lifers is Harvey George. He knew that adjusting to civilian life and finding a job after prison would be difficult and developed a program based on a simple concept. If you can't get a job, create one. George started a life sentence in February of 1978. So how long were you in prison? 17 and a half years. 17 years, yeah. that's a long time. So I'm sure a lot of people want to know why you were in prison. Aiding and abetting conspiracy, aiding and abetting to a homicide. See, I had to learn how to say that. I didn't want to say murder. Right. What, what kind of homicide? I introduced a guy to um, a fence to get rid of some jewelry. And uh, him and the fence got into a beef about money, and I think the fence was trying to take the jewelry. He killed the guy and he called me and said, hey, look, I need to get back into New York. On the way to New York, he tells me, he said, man, I had to get rid of that guy. So how much time were you supposed to do or was it supposed life. to be 17 years? In fact, I was- You I, were supposed to do life in prison? I have life, I have life. I've been on parole 20 years. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So how, what did you do to get out early or? Well, I guess you said good behavior. I did everything I could. I did every program I could. I went to school. I did everything I could. And then they recommended that they give me 10 more years. And what was that for? <laughs> to let me know, don't do it no more. Gotcha. But uh, the warden, you know, he knew I had been trying. So he said, well, he said, you know, Mr. George, I can't do nothing for you. Well, he said, Harvey, you know. There's nothing that I can do for you about what they're going to do. He said, but I'm going to tell you a little something. I got a lot of faith in you. He said, you got minimum and I'm going to put you in the halfway house. He said, you got six months. Show them what you do working with. And you sure did. Yes, I did. Do you feel that the city doesn't provide the people with enough choices or ex-offenders with enough choices? Of course not. And I think some, uh, let me say this, there's an element of city and county who's beginning to look at it and beginning to, you know, ver you know give verbal homage to it. Where did you come up with the, the name Friends of the Lifers? Because I ran the program in prison called the Lifers Group Scared Straight. And so I wanted to emphasize my intent is that the lifers had a friend out here that would help them when they got out. Friends of the Lifers costs about $25,000 a year to operate and is funded by the Hudson County and Jersey City Community Development. Annette Joyner Jackson is the executive director of Friends of the Lifers and understands the struggle of these ex-convicts because she too did prison time. She was caught selling drugs. Do you feel that everyone deserves a second chance? Definitely. Everyone deserves a second chance because you never know why an individual um, got in a situation that they, you know, they got in. What stopped me was it was a wake up call when I went to jail and having to have to fight for yourself and protect yourself by all means necessary. It was something I said I would never relive again. And when I walked out of that jail, I never went back to the streets again, never, never. The workers are given housing nearby, and we wondered 
what the neighbors thought about having ex-convicts working and living in their backyards. Maggie Dickinson doesn't like it, but thinks gentrification will soon take hold and clean things up. To me, that garden only will be there for a couple of months. As soon as the developer come by and want that land for houses, the garden is going to be gone. So that's why I'm not worried about it. Cheryl Brown, another Greenville resident, has a more practical approach. I really don't think that should make a difference. There's ex-offenders all over. So, you know what I'm saying? Practically everybody got an ex-offender in their family. I got them in mind. So. And I would like for somebody to give them a chance. I had a son that's ex-offender. He got his life started again. You know, so everybody needs a chance. Harvey George agreed. So what would you tell someone in the community who feels negative about Friends of the Lifers, who doesn't want you guys in this community doing what you're doing? Well, I'd tell them to look into their family and find that one that need Friends of the Lifers. Then ask me, do you still want me to be out of here? It's an all too common story in America's inner cities. Boy meets girl, girl gets pregnant, boy skips out, girl has to work to support baby. So who steps in? Grandma. The number of grandparents raising their grandchildren is on the rise, and that's led to some troubling concerns. How are seniors, given their slower pace and lower earnings potential, supposed to handle physical and financial challenges of raising kids? Well, in the South Bronx of all places, we found something of a solution. Safe, affordable housing that is open exclusively to grand families. There, they find not only safe haven, but also some much needed social services and a sense of community. And here it is. At 951 Prospect Avenue, splashes of color illuminate the community and the lives of 50 families inside, one of which is headed up by Lucy Walters. Oh, this is my kitchen. Mm -hmm. I fixed it up like this. At age 78, she found herself raising not just a grandson, but a great-grandson as well. Does that frustrate you? No. No. These kids give me life. Give me life. I'm, I'm 78 years old. And you're happy raising them? Yes, I am happy raising my two grands. Some of the circumstances of her situation were unclear. Lucy was very tight-lipped about the specifics. But her neighbor, Catherine Lee, was more open and told us why she had to take custody of her granddaughter. My granddaughter would be, you might as well say, taking care of herself at one and a half. That was 17 years ago. Catherine raised her granddaughter because her own daughter was struggling through life. She was on a uh, crack. So what about your relationship with your daughter now? Well, my daughter passed. How were your emotions? How did you feel when your daughter passed away? Well, when she passed away, I felt that she was better off because she wasn't suffering no more. She wasn't sleeping on the subways no more. She wasn't in danger no more. You have your granddaughter. Is there ever a point where you say you want to not make her like her mother? All the time. And she would always state that she's not gonna be like her mother. She's gonna finish school regardless of how old she is. She's gonna graduate. Where's her father? He's in Ohio somewhere. I asked her when she was about nine and a half, I asked her, I gave her the option. Do you want to live with your father or do you want to stay with me? She said she wanted to go with her father. Okay, I let her go with her father, but I also told her, at any time that you feel that you don't want to stay, my door is always open. She stayed there for about a month and a half, and my doorbell rung, her father was bringing her back because she didn't want to stay. The Grandparent Family Apartments is funded by Presbyterian Senior Services. Along with helping grandparents, this building is a place where children can improve not only their personal lives, but their academic career as well. Social worker Michelle Chapel is the director of this program. She says the services go beyond the bricks and mortars of the building. 
It's about supporting grandparents raising minor children. When the kids turn 23, they are provided with services to get them ready for the real world. I mean, we do money management to help them find an apartment. We help them figure out how to live, okay? Meaning that's work, um, the, paying the rent and the bills in certain situations. So we continue to work with, with the family. Counseling, all of that continues outside of the building when they grow up. They can always come back here. Yes. But in this intergenerational building, the kids are top priority. Like five-year-old Miguel, who uses the building's services to be like a kid. Miguel's grandmother, Amelia Musio, told us how attached he became to her, so much that he sometimes becomes jealous, even of his grandmother's husband. My husband had came to visit, right? I had some information to give him, and he, um, uh, he just gave me a smack on, on the lip, right? And uh, Miguel, he just went in the room, you know, I didn't pay too much attention, and when he came back, he had his little things in two bags. He had his clothes ready to go because he tell me, he said, and I said, where are you going there, baby? He tell me, he said, you have Jerry, he told me. That, that's my second husband. And I said, what do you mean you got Jerry? He said, I'm, I'm out, <laughs> just like that. Wow. And then I, mm -hmm. and I put him on my lap and I told him, I said, you know what? I said, you know you're still the man of the house. I love you. I said, what am I going to do about love to I said, Jerry, he's not here to stay. You know, and then you know what? He got down and he went and put his clothes up and said, and I said, you're not going the way are you? He said, no, and he went in the back. <laughs> I shed a little bit of tears when he did that, you know? He was afraid that he was going to lose you. It was me, yeah. That's, that's what made me kind of a little emotional. And, uh, and, I, and I reassure him, you know, that, that I love him. I tell him every day, too. He tells me that, too. Every day he tells me. Mothers and fathers who walk out on their children can have a long-term effect no matter the age, and the grandmothers feel it's their responsibility to pick up the pieces. Like Evelyn Relaford, who was raising her great-grandchildren after she felt that her granddaughter wasn't fit to take care of her kids. Do you feel that you're breaking the cycle? I hope so. You know, I'm trying to stop these mothers from abusing their children because there's a lot of it going on. Evelyn's daughter walked out of her child's life. That child has since had sons of her own, who she now has abandoned. When you first adopted your great-grandchildren, how, how did they feel? I know they were comfortable with you because you're, you're Nana, mm -hmm. you know? But how did they feel when they didn't see their mother more and more, like time just went apart? Like I say, I, it really hurt the oldest one. It did, the oldest one, like, but the small one, he, you know, the younger one, he didn't pay no mind. But of all the grandmothers we met, Maria Vega, raising three grandchildren, gave us perhaps the truest sense of what this building is all about, that they really are one big grand family. I'm a grandmother, and I have here 97 grandkids, because all the kids in this building belong to me. They my grandkids.